Hello, everybody. Welcome to our fourth webinar of the Garden Club. I uh, just wanted to uh, remind you that at the bottom of the screen, there is ask a question. If you have any questions for Kara during the presentation, just type them in and we'll try to answer them all at the end of the presentation. Uh, it looks like Ginger might be having some problems with her volume. Just try clicking on your volume button. Um, you should all be able to hear us now. Um, and we'll go to Claudia. Hello, everyone. Um, we just came off an inauguration and I think some of us feel very inspired. Um, so we can make a difference too in this world. And that is why we have this particular speaker, Kara Tyler Julian, to join us. Just a few comments about the club business. Um, we're financially intact. Um, see board minutes from Kathy Patton. We met our commitment to donate a tree to the city of Bradenton Beach and their renovation of Katie uh, Perola Park. Um, we also want to welcome new members, Barbara Foley and Debbie Goodwin, and we look forward to meeting you once we have our immunizations. That day is coming. In fact, I hear there's another 3,000 vaccinations just being released this moment, so look for uh, on your phones. Um, you will be receiving a community um, survey. Um, this is to help out one of our members, Mary Lang, to gauge community interest in a community garden. Uh, they're proposing one near Grassy Point Park. Um, so that will be coming in your email. Uh, thank you to members who have been watering the library indoor plants. The li librarians tell us that the patrons like to sit near the plants and love them. Uh, we could use a few more volunteers. It's a very low commitment uh, water once a week for one month. And uh, please let Kathy Gerlitz know if you are available. So um, we are very pleased to have uh, Kara Tyler Julian join us once again. She was a popular speaker last year. Uh, she has her master's degree in entomology from the University of Florida. And she's worked as a crop consultant she works for the Mosquito Department for Lee County in South Florida. Uh, if you know where Sanibel Island is, she's just a few miles inland from there. And this is one of the powers of our, uh, our current virtual meeting so that she can join us even though she lives quite a few hours away. Um, she's an avid native plant gardener and is active in the Florida Native Plant Society. And creatures beyond bugs are a big part of her life, she tells us. She has two dogs, four parrots, one, tur one tortoise, and one tarantula. So, uh, Kara, um, we're, we're ready for you. All right, thank you very much for that great introduction. And I am definitely happy to be here and happy that all of you are joining on this very exciting day. And uh, this is a very exciting topic. So this topic got really big a couple years ago when there was a big study that came out about insects around the world declining. So it got a lot of buzz and everybody, of course, wants to know why are the insects declining? So I'm going to talk about that today. But before I talk about that, we need to cover what an insect is. So in order to get to insects, we start in the same kingdom that we humans are in the kingdom animalia because insects just like us are, are animals. But we have to go down four levels further to get all the way to the insects. So they're quite separated from us as animals. And then if you want to get to a certain species of insect, you have to go four levels further than that. Now, when I am talking to another entomologist, if I use the word bug, we're talking about an insect that looks like this little green guy here. Um, for entomologists, the term bug covers one tiny order of insects. Well, it's not tiny, it's quite large, but one order of insects called the hemipterans, which are true bugs. But when I'm talking to anybody else, so you guys right now, anyone 
who is not a pedantic entomologist. If I use the term bug, I'm talking about insects and also all of these guys. So today when we're talking about the importance of insects and uh, reasons for their declines, we can include all of these other arthropods with them because they will be similarly impacted by all of these things. Now, uh, a lot of people might just throw up their hands and just say, well, why do we care that insects are disappearing? What do we need them for? Why don't we just let them disappear? Who cares? They perform a lot of vital ecosystem services for us as humans and for the ecosystem. So without the ecosystem, we can't be here. We like to think that we are above the ecosystem as humans because you know, especially when we're living in cities, we live so far removed from it, but we do need the ecosystem. Once that collapses, it's just going to be a chain reaction of things that we can't even survive. So myriad uh, ecosystem services that they are able to do for us, but also they supply food for certain cultures of humans. Maybe not us yet, but in the future, eating insects might be a more important part of our diets especially since it can be a more um, environmentally friendly source of protein. But also insects are a source of certain fabrics such as silk and other things like that. So we'll go through all the importance here. In terms of food, insects are, as we all know, a huge part of the food chain. If you take away the insects, you have a gigantic portion of the food chain that is gone your entire ecosystem is just gonna collapse after that because you start with your healthy soil, then you have your plants, and then you have your insects eating the plants and then all of the different animals that feed on those insects. So these six creatures here are just a few, just a tiny representative of the many native animals we have here in Florida that rely on insects as either a part of their diet or their entire diet at some point in their life. So without insects, none of these particular organisms would make it through all the way to adulthood. In addition to being important as a food source, insects are also important for decomposition services. And as I was talking about the, uh, the food chain where it starts with good soil, without insects, the soil wouldn't be as good as it is. So in our forests, when you have trees that die, our termites, are there to help start that decomposition process. They help to start decomposing those huge dead trees that would other, otherwise just pile up and prevent other new trees from growing. They would lock up those nutrients in those trees. So the termites start breaking that wood down. And with the, um, with the help of their friends, the fungi and bacteria, that is then turned into the beautiful soil, which becomes nutrients for new plants. In addition to termites, we have other decomposers in the insect world. We have our dung beetles, and there are many species of dung beetles. The one on this slide, that beautiful rainbow colored insect, that is our native rainbow scarab dung beetle, really gorgeous. And that one will take pieces of animal excrement and dig a hole in the ground and bring that excrement down into the ground for its young to survive on. So that is helping to take all that animal waste that would otherwise be out there just sitting there and work it into the soil, again, as nutrients for the plants. And then we have so many others that help with the decomposition process. We have ones that we might not like to think about, like roaches. Uh, they are pretty disgusting, but they're out there really helping out with the ecosystem. They're breaking down that leaf litter and other debris and detritus in the forest to help us have beautiful soil. Pollination is one that most of you already know about. Most people know the importance of pollinators. That has also been very large in the news. But mostly what they've covered in the news is European honeybees and their importance to our domestic crops. But we have to remember, it's not just humans on this planet. There are other animals that rely on the greater ecosystem, which includes hundreds and hundreds of species of native plants, which rely on hundreds if not thousands of species of native insect pollinators to help them to survive and reproduce. So we don't just wanna think about the honeybees, we wanna think about our native bees and their importance to our native plants as well. I'm gonna talk briefly about honeybees. 
a lot of people like to think that they're something we should really be focusing on saving. And while the farmers need to think about that, the rest of us, I don't think we need to go out of our way to try to save the honeybees because honeybees are like feral hogs or feral cats. They are a domesticated, non-native, technically invasive animal that was brought over here for us to help us out. And there are beekeepers who can take care of them in their hives. Um, but as far as out in the ecosystem, we don't necessarily want them there. There is research showing that honeybees can actually outcompete our native bees and pollinators for nectar and pollen resources. So for the ecosystem itself, honeybees aren't something we necessarily want here in America where they are not native. Now, other things that insects are good for in addition to food for some cultures, they are used as a source of dyes for everyone. The silk that is used for clothing, that comes from an insect. There are cosmetics that have various insect materials in them. And there's the potential that we could have medicine coming from insects. So we have millions of species of insects out there. We still don't know about all of them. And there could be an insect that produces a compound that might have some really helpful medicinal applications that we just don't know about yet. So we really wanna save the insects for those purposes. So these are, <clears throat> excuse me, these are two species right here of insects that are covered in different species of fungus. There are a lot of different fungal species that live on insects. And some of these could also potentially have medicinal applications. There's actually one that is really well known. It's called the cordyceps fungus. And that you can even find if you go to Whole Foods, you can find certain supplements and uh, beverages that are made with that particular cordyceps fungus, which grows on insects. One benefit of insects that people don't often talk about is their benefit to us in terms of water quality. They are key indicators of water quality in various habitats, and they're often used in environmental surveys to determine the health of a body of water. So they act as sort of the canaries in the coal mine for us to know if there's something going on with that body of water. They can, by looking at the assemblage of different insect species, how diverse they are, how abundant they are in different water bodies, that can tell us something about what kind of pollution is present in there? Or is it polluted at all? Or is it perfectly clear water? Do we have a lot of uh, maybe nitrogen, too much uh, phosphorus in that body of water, too much mercury? By looking at the insect species there and identifying them, we know very clearly if there's a problem with that water or not. And if we lose the insects, we no longer have this ability and we'll just have to use modern laboratory materials to do all that. When we have our, uh, we have a lot of insects that live in the soil and when they build their nests down in the soil, this is another thing that is very beneficial that people don't usually think about. They are being soil engineers. They're moving the soil around. They are making tunnels in the earth. They're bringing food down into those tunnels. And what they're doing is they're creating, not on purpose, they're not trying to help the environment. The ants don't care. They just, they, they're doing their thing. But inadvertently, they're creating tunnels into the ground through which water can infiltrate, air can infiltrate, nutrients can infiltrate. So they're making that soil so that it has now a little bit more health than it might have had before by helping to aerate soils, add in water and nutrients. Now, sometimes this can be detrimental as well. So you might notice sometimes if an ant builds an ant nest right at the base of one of your plants, that plant might die because sometimes it can be too much aeration for a plant. But for the most part, it is helpful to have this turnover of our soils. And of course, there is just the simplicity of the beauty of the diversity of insects. So we don't always need to put money on things, I don't think. There's some things you just can't put a price on. And you can't put a price on the ability to go out in your garden and enjoy the sighting of a gorgeous butterfly. And then the next day you go out and there's another species of butterfly. Or you're out for a walk and you see a beautiful fly you've never seen before or a iridescent green bee that you haven't noticed before. So this diversity of insects, the 
2 million, 3 million, 5 million species we don't know yet that we have on this planet is something you really just cannot put a price on, the ability to constantly find something new in our environment. And last but not least, a great benefit of insects that we are using in these modern times is their ability to be used as biocontrol agents. So we have here the air potato leaf beetle that feeds on our invasive air potato plants and a species of thrips that feeds on Brazilian pepper plants. So these guys are out there helping us to control our invasive plants without us having to use so much herbicides and uh, money for spending to cut down lots of trees out there. So the causes for insect decline are still not fully pinned down and there's not one cause that we can put our finger on and say, this is it, this is the smoking gun, this is what has done it. So there is a lot of debate still about which is the most important cause of their decline and it depends on the species of insect. So different species are declining for different reasons. In the temperate areas, most of the studies I've seen show what you can see on this slide here, this picture. In the more temperate hemispheres and in more developed countries and cities, the main driver they think is intensive agricultural with the pesticides and fertilizers that go along with them. But that's the number one cause for the decline, followed by invasive organisms, urbanization, deforestation, and so on and so forth, getting as uh, less and less the cause of decline. However, I have seen other studies that show the complete opposite of what you see here. So in more uh, areas like around the equator, areas where you have islands and uh, in the middle of a rainforest, areas where you don't have a lot of development and where it's more tropical, the main cause of the insects that are declining there is climate change. It's usually climate change there and then deforestation as a huge cause with intensive agriculture and pesticides being the tiniest cause because they are so rural and away from anywhere where this would happen. Now climate change, the way that in, impacts our insects and kills them off is because it's completely destroying and upending entire ecosystems. So when you do that, you're getting rid of the insects. So increased wildfires, wiping out entire forests, you're wiping out every single insect that was in that forest. Same thing with hurricanes. We all saw what, what it looked like in the aftermath of the hurricanes like Maria that flattened Puerto Rico. When you tear out an entire forest, the insects are going with it. There might be some that can hide from that and survive, but a lot of them are gonna be killed in one fell swoop. Same thing with all these other things, floods, drought, anything that's going to impact that ecosystem is impacting the insects. And additionally, there is the new uh, problem we have with seasons where they no longer stay separate. We now have winter stretches into spring or we have summer stretching into spring. Our different seasons are getting shorter or longer and changing year to year. And insects rely on seasonal cues to know when to do the next life cycle. So if an insect comes out of diapause too early because it thinks it's springtime and it's a, the insect goes and lays eggs and starts the next generation, if then winter continues on, starts back again, and we have a huge snow, those insects are now, uh, that generation has been killed and that's a problem. A very big one that impacts insects everywhere, no matter what, is habitat loss. And that's because, like I said, if you get rid of an ecosystem, you got rid of the insects. So when they completely tear out these forests here in Florida to build these communities, these homes, well, there's no, nothing left for the insects to live on. So this is one area right here in this picture on this slide. This is in Lee County. It's a city called Cape Coral. And this middle section here you can see, that's what that entire city used to look like. Beautiful pine flatwoods, with low wetland areas. At one time, that's what that city looked like completely. But now you can see on the edges of it, what the city looks like. They've completely flattened the land, dug canals, put houses on it, put lawns of non-native grasses on it. And maybe if they're lucky, they planted an exotic palm tree 
or uh, maybe a bougainvillea or something like that, but nothing that the insects can eat. So we're taking away their property that not their, we're taking away their forest and replacing it with human property that is not at all productive for them. It doesn't have any of the plants they need to eat. It doesn't have any of the structure that they need to hide in. It's just completely foreign to them. And so our insects are now gone from that area. And this goes into the loss of food because when you take away their host plants, you take away the food for the base of that food chain. No plants means no plant eaters, means no predators or parasites and so on and so forth. Pesticides is one that a lot of people are most concerned with. And this is the thing that people spend most of their effort, it seems, trying to point the finger at and blame for these declines. And in some areas it can be, again, agriculture where it's very intensive. But it should be noted, and I have a couple of quotes here to this end, that even if you do have pesticides being sprayed somewhere and potentially killing off some insects, as long as you have the habitat there for some insects to have hidden from the pesticides, those insects can recover after the pesticide is gone, once it's sprayed, the spray has broken down, the insects can recover as long as they have the habitat to do so. But that's the problem right now, is we have the habitat destruction in combination with the pesticides. So the pesticides that are an issue, where pesticides are the issue, are the broad spectrum pesticides. These are the ones that kill every single insect out there. They don't target a certain species or family of insects, they target all of them. These are the problem. But again, even these can be used somewhat safely if they're used by professionals and applied correctly. And the way things are usually applied incorrectly is they're applied at too high of a rate, they're applied with the wrong equipment. They're applied at the wrong time of day. And this is usually not professionals doing these inappropriate applications. It's usually homeowners or landscapers who don't know what they're doing, who are causing these misapplications that can really have an impact. So homeowners can go to Home Depot. They don't need a license. They don't need any education. They can buy the most toxic pesticide on the shelf, which most people do. Most uh, Gardeners that I talk to that like to use pesticides, they go for things like malathion and seven dust, which are both hugely broad spectrum. The most toxic ones that, you know, non-licensed professional non-licensed homeowners can get their hands on. And so these are terrible. They shouldn't be using these. They're killing everything in their yard with those products, but that's what they use. And they're going to use the highest, do highest dose. They're not going to follow the label, homeowners. They're going to use the highest those they think will work because they want it to. And they're probably not gonna be applying it at the right spot of the yard at the right time of day. And this leads to two of the biggest areas that are issues for pesticides and that's golf courses and lawns because people want their grass to be very green. People playing golf don't wanna see a living insect on the entire golf course. So those are areas that have some of the highest rates of pesticide application of anything. If you look on the EPA uh, approved doses that they allow for different areas, golf courses and lawns get to have the highest dose. They get to do 20, even up to 100 times what mosquito control or farms are allowed to use. So it depends on which pesticide is being applied, where it's being applied, and how it's being applied, if it, whether it's going to be an issue for our native insects or not. And another issue, introduced species, is one that we don't know enough about yet, I don't think. We know that they have an issue, we do, but we have more than 500 species of invasive plant and animals here in Florida. We certainly haven't had the time to research every single one of those 500 species to know what kind of an impact they're having on our ecosystem. Everybody knows about the pythons, eating rabbits and raccoons in the Everglades, but we don't know about the uh, night anoles, the Cuban anoles, the Cuban tree frogs, the cane toads, the amoebas and agamas and monitor lizards, and what they might be doing to the insects right in our own yards. So we have all these insectivorous amphibians and reptiles from 
other countries that have been brought here and are reproducing like mad and eating all of our insects. So I'm sure that is definitely a part of the problem that we should look at more. And of course we have invasive insects that could be out competing and even eating our native insects. And finally, the real base of all of these reasons for the decline of insects is humans. It's us, it's all the things we do. So many little things that add up to bigger things that impact every living thing on the planet. So there's all of our ways of travel using fossil fuels, which increases our greenhouse gases, which leads to climate change worsening, which impacts everything. There's our re-engineering of the land and water to make it so that we like to live there and nothing else does. And it's even small things like fly zappers that people think are great to have on their porch, but fly zappers kill every nocturnal insect that is attracted to light. They're not just killing mosquitoes, they're killing all of your nocturnal flies and beetles that fly past and go to it and get killed. It's drops in a bucket, but those drops in a bucket really can add up. Then of course there's pollution. That's a thing that we do as humans too. We like to put all of our stuff everywhere. So chemicals in the air and water, but also for insects, there's noise and light pollution that we don't talk about. So just like for the sea turtles, lights can impact our insects. So we have nocturnal insects that at night rely on light either for communication, as is the case with fireflies who use light to communicate and find each other for reproductive purposes. And then there's a lot of nocturnal insects who use light for wayfinding. So they usually fly in different patterns depending on, for example, the moon. And when we have our lights on at night, that's very disruptive to their behaviors. And for the noise, we have a lot of insects that communicate by sound. That's how they find their reproductive partners. And again, we have a lot of noise in our world. So it's so many things that we do, so many behaviors we can look at and try to make changes. And so again, why do we care? This is something each person has to decide for themselves. I can't tell you why you should care. I can give you a list of reasons, but you have to think about it for yourself why you personally might wanna care about insects and do something about it. For me, it's a big part of it is just the beauty of the diversity of insects and just being enriched by going out into the world and seeing new species every day. But for you, it might be something else. It might be the pollination services they provide in your garden. Now, what you can do, there are a lot of things. I don't want anybody to feel that this is a defeatist presentation, that I'm telling you humans are bad and we're terrible and there's nothing we can do. We can do so many things, so many tiny behaviors we can change that will add up. One big thing you can do that seems tiny is your vote. When you go to the polls, who you help elect can greatly impact our environment. So especially at the local level, so much as county commissioners, choose those who are committed to protecting the environment over development. And you'll know, you know which commissioners are running because they have a lot of real estate mogul friends who want to pave over the entire county. And there's other commissioners who want to make sure they use county money to buy more preserves and preserve more natural areas. So you know which ones you should vote for. Another thing you can do personally is gardening with native plants and doing other gardening things to help insects. And anywhere in your life where you can make changes to help fight climate change will also help. So for gardening for insects, big thing of course, plant as many native plants as you can. Doesn't have to be all natives. You can mix in some non-natives but the more natives, the better. Leave the leaves for our insects that like to live in leaf litter. Have a wood pile or a pile of sticks for the insects that nest in twigs and branches. Have an area where there's just bare sand with nothing on it for our ground nesting native bees. And if you have the space to have a water feature, even if it's tiny, that is a great way to help encourage our aquatic insects as well. Also in your gardens, Reducing pesticide use is very important because the pesticides that are mostly impacting insects are the ones that we put on our plants that the insects would be eating. It's fine to use pesticides on your house to protect your house from structural pests like termites, 
but in your garden on your plants, try to limit it as much as possible. Uh, finally, I just want to show you that there are, so there's a lot of scientists out there who will preach and preach and preach about fighting climate change and things you need to do to help fight climate change. But you go to those scientists' houses and see their personal life and they're not doing anything. You know, that particular scientist who's saying climate change is terrible might be driving an SUV and might live in a house with a giant lawn. But I just want to show you, I practice what I preach. So this is my house here. The top figure is what it looked like when we bought it. And the bottom figure is now. So we have gotten rid of the lawn, added a lot of native plants, mostly native plants, and then some edibles. And we've bought the lots around us to expand the area to one acre of preserved land. And we've added solar panels and we do everything we can to decrease our fossil fuel footprint. So just want to let you know, I'm not just asking you guys to do this. I'm in it with you. I'm changing as much as I can to make sure I help the environment and the insects and the birds and the plants. So here is some follow-up reading. If you want, there's four books. The top link, which I can make sure gets sent out to anyone who wants it, that is to the most recent uh, journal of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. This most recent issue was dedicated to the global decline of insects. So they had a whole issue on it that just came out last week. So this is perfect timing. And this particular journal is open access. So it's free to anybody to read. You don't have to pay to be a member of that particular society to read the science. And with that, I'll take any questions that anyone has. Thank you very much, Kara. This is the second time I've seen your presentation and I swear I learned as much as I did the first time through. So I may have to watch it again. Which All right. Is good about our presentation is you can do a replay on it. Um, so we have 10 questions here. I'd like to um, go through and um, we'll, we'll jump in right here. Uh, how do you feel about uh, spot pesticides in our yard with products like Roundup? So spot treatments are totally fine. And that is a part of integrated pest management. So just choosing a very small area and targeting where the actual problem is, is totally fine. Roundup again is also fine as long as it's used responsibly. So areas where they use Roundup over huge swaths of land and use it frequently, not a responsible way, but a homeowner who uses it just around a few spots in the garden where there's weeds, totally fine. Okay. What kind of insects are the best to eat? Uh, so personally, I can't comment on that, but I have heard from people who have eaten insects. They enjoy crickets and grasshoppers. Okay. Uh, what percentage of pollinators are honeybees versus native insects in bees? So that is something that hasn't been adequately quantified, but they have quantified, for example, uh, pollination services, how much pollination is done by honeybees. And it's about, on our crops, it's about 60% of our crop plants uh, that are pollinated by honeybees. In terms of wild plants and all the plants on the planet, 80% need to be pollinated by some insect, not necessarily honeybees, but some pollinator. Okay. Uh, how does pet waste affect dung beetles? So initially, pet waste was beneficial to them. They do enjoy dog waste and cat waste. Uh, some of their favorites are actually uh, pig. They like pig and hog excrement. But now with us being very responsible pet owners, which is great, and giving our pets preventative medications, they've found that those preventative medications, like the heartworm medication, ivermectin, passes through the dog into the feces and seems to be killing off some of the dung beetles. Okay. Uh, what are some of your favorite plants for beneficial insects in your own yard? That's a good question. Uh, diversity is key, so as many different ones as possible. It used to be Biden's Alba or the Spanish Needle, 
which is a great pollinator plant, but anyone who has this knows it's also terrible with its seeds getting everywhere. So uh, at first I let it go crazy in the yard and uh, it got too crazy. And so now that's the one that I pull the most. So good plants that don't stick to your clothes and your pets and take over your yard include things like our native sennas. Bahama senna is a really good one, especially for bumblebees. Our native bumblebees need native legume plants. So Bahama senna, partridge pea, those are really good for our bumblebees. For a good um, all-purpose pollinator plant, I like the native tea bush and the snow square stem. Okay. Uh, how, how do we eliminate mosquitoes because of, you know, the diseases they carry, but keep some for the predators that eat them? So from a homeowner standpoint, you definitely want to get rid of the container breeder mosquitoes. Those are the ones that spread dengue and Zika virus and will be living in your containers and are not native to Florida. So as homeowners dumping out any containers in your yard or treating rain barrels with larvicides to keep the mosquitoes out, but still allowing mosquitoes to live out in the wild and uh, wetlands further away from human habitation. That's the, uh, the best way to go about doing it. Okay, good. I was glad I didn't want to have to invite mosquitoes into my yard. No. What about aphids? I have new growth on bushes that is covered with them. Aphids love new growth. They are attracted to it. They will smell that and make their way to it and they will reproduce very quickly. Uh, the best thing to do is usually if you wait, if you can wait long enough, if you can hold off, the natural predators will almost always show up and take care of that aphid population. So I always say give it two weeks, watch it closely for two weeks. If they continue to get worse and worse after two weeks, your best bet is usually just to spray them off with a really good garden hose. Okay. Uh, do we have a problem with invasive insects not native to the area and do they cause problems? So we do have certainly invasive insects. Uh, again, the most notable ones are honeybees and fire ants. So those are the two that most people will know about and see. The other invasive species, none of them have really gotten to epic proportions where they're having a severe impact on the environment that we know of yet, that we know of. But there's, I mean, certain species of aphids are invasive and not native to here. Okay. Uh, what insect are you most worried about? One that may be helpful, but is disappearing. That would be probably our native bumblebees. They're very helpful. Not even, not just for the native wild plants, but they're also really good for helping to pollinate our blueberry crops and watermelons. And the bumblebees are definitely disappearing. They're one that uh, they nest in the ground. So they need bare soil areas where they can nest in the ground and they need native legume plants are some of their best sources of pollen and nectar. Okay. Uh, and here's our last question. Uh, what lawn substitutes are you seeing being used? Lawn substitutes, mostly I just see people just getting rid of the lawn and just replacing with a mix of shrubs and annual flowering plants. Uh, for people who like to do native ground covers, I see a lot of fog fruit and sunshine mimosa being used as a ground cover to give you that green, uh, close to the ground look. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Kara. As I said before, this is just a fascinating topic. I could probably continue asking you questions for hours here. Um, I want to thank everybody for watching. And remember, our next Garden Club webinar is on February 17th, and it will be with Ginger showing us how to do flower arranging. So thank you.